G'day, g'day. Welcome back to the podcast. It has been certainly a minute since I sat down for my last solo episode, or at least released my last solo episode. And probably for good reason, because usually the podcast is focused on me sitting down with an incredible guest, learning from them, hearing their story, drawing out the actionable insights, and leaving you with a conversation that allows you to learn something new, as well as myself, and to hear from these incredible guests that I've been blessed to have on the show over the last 240 episodes. But sometimes, especially the last couple of weeks, life gets in the way of that. And when I say life, I mean guest reschedule. Um, I actually had two guests planned for today, one in person and one virtual, that both for different reasons had to reschedule the pod to later dates. And that's okay, because life happens. And I used to get more frustrated with that. But these days, I'm learning to accept it. I certainly have learned from past experiences not to try to push a guest into shooting on the day and working around the madness of their life because you definitely don't get them at their best and they don't turn up at their best and that's what I want for the show and not to say that I hold guests to any kind of um, subjective standard but rather I want to make sure that they feel comfortable to come on and have conversations that Uh, enjoyable and natural and don't feel forced or pressured so here I am today to speak to you individually I thought about letting the pod just miss a week but I've been really enjoying recording lately and I've always enjoyed recording the pod but I think there is so much in my life at the moment that feels um, around my work like a bit structured and a bit of an obligation to pay the bills and put money on the table that I really look forward to this time of the week where I get my day off to record the pod and sit down and riff on these ideas, these thoughts, these feelings that I'm sure resonate with some of you. And I wanted to start today, um, I really didn't know what I was going to talk about until literally a moment ago, where I just thought I'd read through some of the stuff I've been journaling and thinking about lately, some of the stuff that is motivating me and inspiring me right now and encouraging me to keep pushing and working towards what I want for my future. And I'll read you something that I wrote probably a week or so ago. And what if you do what you were told to? You play it safe, avoid the risks, and squander your dreams. You drown your sense of adventure to fit the mold. You wear the mask of your persona while your soul screams to be seen and heard. And just when you think you've done everything that the world asked of you, it deals you a dirty hand. Cancer a stroke, the loss of your nearest and dearest. Your boss fires you from that safe job and the world shuts down and locks you in your empty apartment. What then? What was the charade for? You see, we all meet our truth. It knocks and knocks, but amongst the noise of the world, we confuse its knocks for the beating of a drum that only pumps blood around our body. Most people finally hear its knock when the world begins to slip through their fingers and the noise of the world fades away. In a soft and broken voice, it whispers, I was alive in you, I only wish you had heard me sooner. And I feel like, you know, for some people in this world, it makes sense to secure themselves, to play the safe route, because maybe at a time in their life or the way they were brought up, um, there wasn't so much of that. Or maybe they wish there was more of that. And so... The job where they clock in and clock out is absolutely what they need. And I'm not suggesting that that's a bad thing. I think there's certainly um, individual preferences that we all have. But for me personally, I'm remembering and lately been reminiscing a lot on 2020, a year where so much of my life changed, a year in which I was starting to recognize a almost a death within me the death of and this has been over the course of a couple of years the death of like my inner spirit you know as a a kid I was so much of a dreamer like I, I dreamt about doing incredible things with my future you know following passions and all these things that at the time I couldn't articulate with words but now I would look with hindsight and more knowledge and say you know this deep sense of purpose to want to do something really good in the world And I think that was framed, well, I'm certain that was framed because of the household that I grew up in, but also like this deepest 
understanding and knowing that all the challenges that I was facing as a young man with cystic fibrosis and this life that was so different to so many people around me and the way it made me think about my mortality, the way it made me think about the way in which the world works and it works differently for all of us and my place in it. And as a young man, I was always inspired to do something to help other people. And, you know, I always say that like my first dream was to be Batman. As a young kid, like I knew every word to every Batman movie. I'd watch them time and time again. If you're wondering, my favorite at the time was, I think it's Batman Begins with George Clooney um, and Madonna and Jim Carrey and um, Tommy Lee Jones, like just an unbelievable cast. But I love these movies because I love the idea of seeing myself in the hero of those stories. And I'm not suggesting that I think of myself as any hero, but I love that the hero of the story could help people. And there was something about that that struck a chord with me. And I would remember these words that I'd hear time and time again from my parents, friends and the people around me, these adults who would say, this kid has been here before. And I remember I used to ask my parents, what does that mean? You know, I'd sit at a dinner table with the parents and I'd start asking questions of the adults. I would start to share what I thought and what I felt and have these conversations. And I remember we'd go down the beach, we'd go down to the park on a Sunday picnic and as like a really young man, I'm talking from the ages of like five, six and onwards, I would see a group of people in their 20s or their teens playing a game of touch footy or playing a game of beach cricket. And I just wanted to insert myself into that and hear about their experiences and play with them and meet new people. I grew up with an incredibly connected um, family, not just the inner circle, but the outer circle. And often of an afternoon um, after school, while my parents were finishing work, um, at one point in my life, my auntie would pick us up. And me, my sister and my younger cousin, Livy, would go to my auntie and uncle's place and at the time they lived in Cordo, like a bit of a suburban area just outside of Wollongong here, um, but a beautiful part of the world. And on that street, the best mates that I made to hang out with after school were all like six or seven years my senior. I remember being like six or seven years old and playing with these kids who were like 13, 12, 14 in the street. I always gravitated towards people who had more life experience than me that I could learn from. And so I would hear this thing about how I had been here before and I was like an old man's soul in a young man's body. And I think it just multiplied this feeling or this thought or like strengthened, strengthened this idea around wanting to help people and connect with people on a deeper level. And so in 2020, when I had felt like that part of my spirit and my, that like inner kid within me had died and just wasn't around anymore because everything it was about corporate success and trying to obtain that kind of stuff because I thought that would make me feel validated. I thought that if I was successful in the corporate sense and I, you know, had all these material things that, you know, certainly we, some of us still want in life. There are certainly material things that still excite the idea of me, like a nice home to be able to have a family in and, you know, a comfortable car. I'm not really a car guy, but a comfortable car that I can get around in and, you know, pack up full of stuff and have a good time with the people I love. All these things, is, you can still be attracted to them without them being your sole motivational focus or without them being something you want to acquire to feel validated by others. And so, so much of my life in my late teens, early 20s was surrounded by this. And then I, I may have shared this story before on the podcast, but I got particularly crook in 2019 um, I'd had a really sort of dangerous lung infection called Burkholderia capacia um, sort of find its way into my lungs and there were warning signs that maybe something wasn't quite right because, you know, I was starting to break out really bad in my skin and I was losing the colour in my face and I started to feel lethargic and tired and I was coughing a lot and I had a lot of mucus on my lungs and these were signs that my immune system was compromised and that, you know, someone with cystic fibrosis you know your body very well and I knew that something wasn't quite right and I went into hospital um, just after doing a what they call a sputum sample it sounds disgusting but it's a test to check the mucus and see if there's any infection growing in your lungs 
and they picked up this dangerous infection. I remember receiving a call from the doctor and he said to me, Brad, we need to get you in hospital immediately. You have a very dangerous infection in your lungs. It's called Burkholderia capacia. Have you ever heard of it before? And I said, no, I haven't, doc. And he said, well, this infection can um, almost become impossible to get rid of. It's very resistant to treatment if it is allowed to harbor in your lungs for too long. And I remember feeling a little bit deflated because he said, if you don't treat this immediately, um, this infection could damage the cells in your lungs that would allow new lungs or a transplant to bind to your body. And at the time, I certainly had never planned for a transplant, but the idea of the safety net being taken away from you was almost like the, I guess you could imagine as an example, as a real example, sitting on the edge of a plane, you're ready to skydive, you're so excited about it, you're thrilled, you get all this adrenaline, I'm shit scared of that stuff, so I I certainly haven't done this, but I'm imagining this is all hypothetical, right? You're sitting on the edge of the plane, your legs, legs are dangling over the edge, and the instructor goes, three, two, and just before he says one, he says, hey, Brad, I'm sorry. Just to let you know, the safety shoot, we forgot it. We didn't pack it, but hey, that first shoot should be all right. And all of a sudden, that little bit of doubt creeps in that... I don't know if I want to skydive that bad. I don't know if I trust this first shoot as much as I did when I knew there was a backup plan. And it's so funny the way that we think about backup plans as human beings. And certainly to hear that the potential backup plan for a person with cystic fibrosis being that you never want to get to the stage of needing a transplant, but that potential safety net could be taken away from you if you don't get rid of this infection in your lungs. Um, it became very real. And I remember going in a hospital, I got in that afternoon and over the course of that two weeks in hospital, you're always looking for things to do in hospital. And, you know, I met this incredible man, Ernie, who I'm sure you've heard about on the podcast before that, you know, was um, dying of terminal cancer and he taught me a lot about life and we'd have these really amazing conversations over a cup of tea and a few bickies every afternoon where I'd hear about his life and learn about, you know, the things that he was contemplating in his final months. But I remember over the course of this time, I was watching a lot of YouTube, I was watching a lot of interviews, listening to a lot of podcasts, and probably subconsciously this stuff was being um, implanted into my brain at the time as to maybe what the next step of my life could look like because I knew I felt very uninspired and um, just very flat about what I was doing with my life at the time. But I remember this, um, this book that was sitting in the bottom of my bag in hospital every day for that two weeks. It's a book called The Alchemist. And in The Alchemist, um, well, The Alchemist, the book, I'd heard a lot of people talk about this book um, with incredible praise. And these people would say, you know, this book is life-changing. It's my favorite book. And these were people that I looked up to, some famous athletes, some famous thought leaders, some people who I thought had really solid heads on their shoulders and were doing really good things in the world. But I've never been much of a reader and I've always struggled to pick up books because my mind wanders. Um, but this book sat in the bottom of that bag for the whole two weeks. My mum actually had the copy of it and she brought it up for me because I'd asked that of her. And I remember it wasn't until a couple months after leaving the hospital, I was still feeling, you know, I'd gotten better. My lungs had recovered. Thankfully, we'd gotten rid of this infection. But I still felt very flat about the direction of my life. I didn't like the way that it was headed. I didn't um, wake up with a smile on my face in the morning. And I'm not suggesting I had any kind of depression or anything like that. I was just going through a rough patch of my life where I felt directionless, direct, directionless and not broken, but I just felt like I was trying to find my life back. I was trying to enter, I guess, what you'd call that spring season where the life, um, like a tree wood, comes back to me and those leaves start to flower again and you start to feel excited about the summers ahead of you. And... I decided to pick up this book one morning and head to a cafe before work. I remember it was 7 a.m. I sat down with a coffee, had a bagel there that I started munching on, and I started to read this book. And I remember feeling different, feeling like the book was speaking to me. Without knowing what the book was about, I just heard that it was amazing. I started to read this story about a young shepherd boy who was going through his life that felt quite mundane year after year. And he decides to go on this adventure of self-discovery 
to understand and discover what in the book is described as his personal legend, um, which for most of us in life um, would mean our purpose, our life purpose. And this book just captured me. And for about two weeks, I'm a slow reader, mind you, I would go to this cafe nearly every day at 7 a.m. before work and I'd sit down with a coffee and I'd read a few pages of this book. And the story started to implant these thoughts and these feelings on my mind. And one of the quotes from this book that I seen a great mate of mine share the other day, who's been a guest of the show, Colby Thickness, an up-and-coming MMA prospect who's going to take the world by storm. He shared this quote and it just reminded me of you know, this reflection in 2020, sitting down reading this book. And the quote was, it's the possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting. And I just remember feeling like, what is that dream? The possibility of what dream? What does that look like for me? And I just felt so far from an answer because I felt like the last couple of years, all of my dreams and these ideas had been a product of wanting to feel validated by other people didn't know what I was interested in I didn't have any hobbies I didn't have anything that lit me up outside of just spending time with my family and my friends and so I did the most courageous thing I could think to do at this time which was and I'm not recommending this to anyone take this um, advice with a grain of salt well, it's not advice but just take my story with a grain of salt I finished the last page of this book I walked into the office that I worked in at the time in real estate and about an hour later, I handed in my resignation. And I remember sitting down in front of my boss, asking him if I could have a face-to-face conversation with him. And I remember sitting down and saying, I'm done. And they, these were great people. I loved the people that I worked with. I'd just fallen out of love with the pursuit of that industry and you know the space that I was in. And I remember he kind of didn't know what I meant. And I said, mate, I'm leaving. I have to hand him my resignation. And I remember as I said those words, like tears start dripping down my face. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help but feel something really visceral about making that decision. And they weren't tears of sadness. They weren't emotions out of control. It was sheer elation and happiness and this feeling of inspiration that for the first time in a long time for me, The first time since I remember being that young kid that was a dreamer, that had the most incredible hopes for his life, I was making a decision that was about going on that journey of self-discovery to find my personal legend, to craft my own personal legend and purpose. And fuck, that felt so exciting. And so as I left my job, and I just started this little thing that was the podcast, I was only four episodes in, I was figuring it out. I didn't have any idea of whether it could be a career or not, but I was like, I'm going to throw my all into this pursuit of having conversations with people and learning. And I started my charity event for the marathons at the time. And there were so many exciting things in my life, but it was so unknown. I had no plans. And certainly there's been many challenges over the course of the last couple of years. Um, but there's this beautiful quote that I seen the other day in a video um, by a creator that goes by the name of Currently Stuck on TikTok. I believe this young guy is a, I say young guy is probably similar age to me. He's a filmmaker out of the US. Um, and there's this beautiful video all about how in life we don't always recognize in the moment when we're experiencing something for the last time because we're creatures of abundance. Like we always think there'll be more interactions with that person we love. We always think there'll be more times where we go to that place for that summer holiday and we get to enjoy that. So like we're never really present in those things at the time we're experiencing them. But it's often in hindsight that we look back and go, oh, I wish I had the opportunity for that again. And he says, you know, as a kid, you play at the playground one day and then that's the last time you ever do. And it's rather a peculiar thing to say, but you never in the moment think this may be the last time I play at the playground. But in hindsight, we go, far out life has changed so much through then since then but it's all about like stepping into the unknown and like tackling fear and having courage and being vulnerable and there's this beautiful quote from the video that says to avoid the unknown is a result of fear and only acts as a disservice 
And I think that is certainly what holds us back as human beings from, you know, taking these experiences head on is there's a fear of the unknown. There's a fear of, well, there's no certainty in that. And so we prefer the certainty of misery than the misery of uncertainty, you know. And, and I think that's such a weird thing and it's such a challenge to grapple with as, as a person to step outside of the comfort zone and say, hey, I'm going to try this thing and it doesn't have to go well. It's actually okay if it fails, but I certainly don't like the idea of never knowing. And for me, that was the biggest eye-opener as I stepped into this new life where I was starting to figure out these things and start to get a grasp of, you know, what made me tick, what filled me up with joy, what set my soul on fire. And through the podcast and helping people and, you know, hopefully I'd like to think inspiring people and uplifting hope in them through the marathons. Um, that was incredible. And so I feel like over the course of the last four years, the thing I've not taken lightly, because this has been four and a half years of this podcast now since leaving that job, which feels wild. It certainly doesn't feel like that, but so much has happened in my life since. And one of the greatest joys of that, there's been so many great revelations and developments in my life off the back of this. Um, but one of the best things is because of this show and the way that I you know, really try to lean into vulnerability and speak about things openly and the way that the incredible guests come on and do that. And, you know, I've had the privilege of being able to do that on stage now at a heap of different events and I've had all these cool experiences and I meet these incredible people. I get to reach people, people who are at stages in their life going through different challenges and they stumble across these episodes or me on stage and something resonates and that's a really special feeling I don't quite know how to explain it because it's very hard to articulate what that feels like but I received a beautiful message the other day after meeting this incredible lady and I'm not going to name names because um, it's personal she sent me a personal message Um, but Soph and I met her and there was a what would you call it a moment of recognition where she realized that I was the host of this podcast and she said oh my god I can't believe it a lot to talk about you changed my husband's life and she told me a little bit of the backstory which I won't necessarily share but she sent me a beautiful message later that evening that I've written down in my journal it's just a reminder for me about you know why I do these things and this is the message Gosh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for having an outlet for men to come to when they need support and for sharing so vulnerably. You've obviously helped a lot of people, but I'm so grateful my husband found you. And that's such a special thing to receive, to hear that I actually believe, I could get this wrong because you told me a few things that day, but I actually believe that it was a, the podcast was a recommendation by her husband's psychologist to lean into these conversations where men were being vulnerable and being open. And it's, it's so funny, right, because I think about modern masculinity, what it means to be a man in 2024, and I think we have all these different views and we have these views around, you know, men aren't what they used to be or, you know, men are too... We hear these things like men are toxic and there's toxic masculinity... I actually don't think there's such a thing. I I believe that toxic masculinity is actually mistaken. It's not toxic masculinity. It's undeveloped masculinity. And I feel maybe I have a privileged view on this because I grew up with the most amazing um, old boy. My dad is, fuck, he's a gem. I, I love my old man so much. He's, I have very honest conversations with my dad every day on the phone. We're very connected. Um, he was always around during my childhood and I feel that he's for me I've got a literally got a tattoo on the upper left side of my arm of the Hercules statue Um, and the reason I have that tattoo is because it's a symbol of strength for me it's you know the way that the tattoo looks incredible tattoo artist who you know had this idea when we sat down to speak about it I said that this tattoo is going to represent my dad and the way that we designed it was 
from like a bottom, um, from like me looking up at this. So the eyes look down as, as if my dad's looking down over me and I'm looking up to him in admiration as the kind of man that I wanted to be, the symbol of strength um, because my dad did it all. Like he was a, I have an incredible mum too. My mum and dad were both present, but I'm speaking particularly about um, male role models here and modern masculinity. My old man is as tough as they come. I remember all my, all my mates were shit scared of my old man growing up, but loved him. Um, he is a very stoic and strong and masculine looking character. Like he's a big lad for um, nearly 60 years of age. He's always, you know, I'm always striving to sort of chase after my old man and chip away at him. But he was also so emotionally in tune. And I actually called my dad last week. Um, I was at work and I had a bit of a break in my day and I called my dad and we're on the phone for about half an hour and I asked my dad a question. I said, Dad, can I ask you some questions about what it means to be a man? And he said, of course. And I said to him, if you've looked back on yourself when you were my age, I'm 28 now. I said, if you look back on yourself in your late 20s, your early 30s, as you were stepping into marriage, as you were stepping into fatherhood, as you were paving out the path at this point of your life I said is there anything that you think you sacrificed in order to be a good man that wasn't necessary my dad thought about it for a moment and he said no he said I think I think I handled it with pretty good balance I think I handled it pretty well and I'd agree with this but I was interested to hear what he said he said that he had plenty of opportunities to take jobs that he thinks would have made us better off financially Um, And we had a very nice middle-class upbringing. My sister and I never went without. Um, We were were always spoiled on birthdays and Christmases. We certainly weren't spoiled brats. Like my parents done a great job of finding that balance and putting good food on the table. We went to a great school and played sports and really everything you could ask for as a child um, to have a really healthy upbringing. And my dad said, I always over money valued time. Certainly didn't want to be away as a dad I wanted to be present and God I value that so much it's something I think about all the time my dad and my mum were both always there sporting events you know important times in our life birthdays Christmases we just always had this abundance of time with them which was so special but then he said you know what he said in reflection though there's one thing that I maybe would have changed he said my dad was a great athlete and um, played first grade rugby league locally here um, and picked it up again after like taking his whole teens off from the sport and he picked it up again in his early 20s was a great player and probably had some aspirations to try and push and see whether there was any professional opportunity for him um, in sport but he never did he left playing sport for Um, for the security of his job so he didn't get injured because he wanted to build a house and help the builder build the house because that's kind of how he did things back then, right? And he always put his family ahead of any personal aspirations, which is very admirable. But he said one thing to me. He said, and my dad's such a supporter of what I do. He said, mate, I'm so proud of what you've done with the show and what you're doing with your life. And he has these, um, what he likes to call... Um, oh, what does he call them? He calls them like these. So they're almost like these dreams, these daydreams. I'll think of the word for it in a minute. Where he's like, I just have these moments where I click and I can see you doing something incredible off the back of the podcast or interviewing this really, really inspirational and um, well-known character. And I can see you on these stages. And he said, like, I just, I'm so proud of what you're doing please don't give up on it because I genuinely think it makes you a better man. But I also think that your soon to be wife, my beautiful partner, Soph, and your future kids will thank you for it because I believe that the life you'll be able to give them and the kind of man that's coming home is, you know, a family that's going to be better off for it. And it's so nice when you hear that from your dad and I, you know, all of this to circle back and say that the opportunity I have through this to reach people 
absolutely means the world to me. And that is a huge part of the purpose behind it. I've always seen the purpose behind my life professionally and somewhat personally too, is to uplift and inspire hope in others through story. Whether that be the stories I can allow my guests to, you know, I can facilitate and help my guests to share on the show, the story of my own in which I share on stage or when I'm being interviewed. And in these moments and these connections through life, these deep connections where it takes incredible courage to lean into vulnerability. And this is what I was circling back to that, you know, I think that vulnerability is this incredibly important, sometimes forgotten piece of um, the masculine where to truly be a man and to truly you know hope to protect and provide and look out for and help other people you need to be vulnerable yourself and I'm not just talking about speaking on your feelings I'm not just talking about reaching out to people and asking for help all of that stuff's important but anytime you step into the unknown remember like that quote to avoid the unknown is only an act of fear and acts as a disservice. Anytime you step into the unknown, you're being vulnerable. You're putting yourself on the line. You're putting your ego on the line. You're putting your future on the line, your finances on the line. Whatever it may be, when you're stepping into the unknown, you're being vulnerable. And to be vulnerable, it takes courage. And I'd say that courage and that strength to do that, step into fear, to step into the unknown, is an incredibly masculine trait and so I want to be able to to continue to do this to connect with people and help people off the back of the show and you know lately there's been a I feel like lately the universe has been testing me a little bit I'm probably getting a little bit spiritual here when I say things like the universe but I'm recognizing as I'm getting older and thinking about life and the role that I want to play in the kind of person I want to be I say the role that I want to play not that I'm playing any kind of character or persona but like the kind of person I want to be is is the better way of explaining it there's definitely a side to me that's becoming more spiritual because I think that you know spirituality is a connection to faith and I'm not talking religion here but like faith in the fact that things are working in your favor I just lost a little bit of that lately, a little bit of that connection to my dreams where I'm so busy with work all the time and, you know, like the reason I mentioned at the top of the show that there's no guest episode this week is because usually I've only got one day to film because I'm working five days a week and then I've got to film a day, then I've got an edit a day and then sometimes speaking gigs pop up or meetings pop up or life happens and so I'm almost trying to fit three jobs into one week I mean, one of them's full time, and I'm, of course, I'm an employee, so I'm rocking up and trying to be valuable and and doing what's required of me to make sure that, you know, I'm I'm deserving of the job and the opportunity I've been given. That keeps a roof over our head, keeps food on the table, which I'm really grateful for. But I just over the course of the last probably two three months, I just lost a little bit of that that kid, that dreamer in me again, where life just gets all a little bit busy the mind gets cluttered and you almost start to become a little bit more pessimistic about things you're a little bit more frustrated when the guest pulls out or when something gets rescheduled and I just feel like after the the week that I've had or the last couple of weeks really something sparked in me again where I'm excited about this stuff and I feel like I'm leaning into trying to push a little bit harder and reconnect with this And I almost think the universe was giving me a few signs to to lean back into that. I kind of felt a little bit flat about the numbers of the pod. It hadn't been reaching the amount of people I thought it would. I had pretty big goals for the podcast this year off the back of a really good year last year. And, you know, I thought, you know, it's going to step up this year. It's going to be a major step up. Worked really hard on securing amazing guests and had a really strong start of the year. And the numbers just kind of didn't weigh up where I thought they would. And I remember just being a little bit flat and a little bit discouraged by it. And just thinking, you know, is this pod even reaching people? And then the other week I'm walking down the street, probably two, three weeks ago now. And as I do, I like to say get eight of people when I walk past and just try to be positive and 
be a nice person out in public and in the community and walking past this fella um, he's obviously on his way to work on my way I'm on my way to my car to go to an appointment and I say g'day mate and just sort of you know do that little awkward smile and head nod thing that you do when you walk past someone in the street and we walk past each other for maybe five meters and he stops and he goes oh mate you're that fella that was on the Dylan Friends podcast aren't you and I was like oh yeah I am actually that was got nearly a year ago to the day and he starts to tell me about how much he loved the episode and how much he connected with it and you know he's gone back to it a few times and I'm like oh that's that's really nice that's a nice reminder that you never know who's listening to you and then literally just a week ago um, I'm sitting down at a cafe by myself I uh, had a day off and was doing a bit of editing and I decided to take myself for a coffee it was a sunny day I was like I'm gonna go for a coffee I'm gonna sit in the sun and I'm gonna do some writing and then I'll go home and do some more editing and as I'm sitting down at this cafe this huge group of youngsters pull up probably in their late teens early 20s pull up um, for a group coffee and I'm sitting by myself on this table of four and they come over and they're like hey do you mind if we steal a couple um, seats and tables and I'm like go for your life and I'm sitting there writing and this fella comes up to grab the last chair and he goes hey mate do you mind if I take this and I look up at him and I say of course mate no stress and he goes oh shit you're the guy from um, Instagram that talks about um, cystic fibrosis he goes man I love your videos really inspirational thanks for sharing stuff and I was like oh thank you mate I appreciate that and I shook his hand and we had a chat and I was like oh it's just another reminder and then just this last week as I said to receive this lovely message from the lady that Soph and I met um, just reminded me of a quote that was really at the forefront of my mind through the course of 2020, a quote that I kind of think I framed, but maybe I didn't, uh, that purpose fuels progress. And that was something that we, we kept saying amongst our group of mates as we were preparing for our first marathon together, that, you know, purpose fuels progress. If there's a big enough why, um, as Viktor Frankl says, a man can figure out almost any how, something along those lines. And I was just journaling that I certainly believe that everything leading up to this moment has been preparing me for something incredible, a platform to change lives and leave my corner of the world an uplifted and inspired space. And as I like to do, getting a little bit whimsical, just thinking that like in a world where the morning light paints a pretty picture in the sky, where caterpillars find their wings and take shape as butterflies, where laughter is infectious and love can bind two souls, anything is possible Anyone can achieve their dreams and goals. This life is certainly a miracle. Take great pleasure in, in the ride. Anything is possible if you believe and only try. And I just feel like I've had these beautiful reminders lately to continue pushing forward, to continue delivering um, my best through these platforms to everyone who listens and, and seems to get something out of it. And... You know, I think that that's an encouragement for everyone that, you know, have to believe, you have to believe, like you have to have that faith that the things that mean something to you are worth pursuing, they're worth exploring, they're worth leaning into and taking chances for. Because otherwise, where do you end up? Bitter, taking the safe route, trying to do what you think is the safe option. And then when those things don't necessarily work out or maybe life you know, slaps you across the back of the head and reminds you that it certainly isn't fair, then there's this sense of frustration from us that, you know, well, life has betrayed us, but no, you betray life. It's your responsibility as a human, as an individual to lean into the things that mean something to you. You know, everything is earned, nothing is given. And Soph sent me this beautiful quote yesterday. She said, The world won't let you feel comfortable where you shouldn't belong. The world won't let you find peace or settle where you shouldn't be. And she said, I feel like this is the reason why you never fully feel settled in the jobs and the pursuits that don't align with your purpose and set your soul on fire. And I think the path of the dreamer is full of treasures that won't be found but can be felt and I think you've got to lean into the feeling you know it's such a cliche but 
everyone says, oh, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. The reason it's a cliche is because it's true. You know, I don't think our dreams are destinations. I think what I've been reframing um, the thoughts around my dreams to be is that my dreams are just like a compass. Like they're giving me a true north. They're giving me a direction to head in. And along the course of that direction, that path, that journey, whatever you want to call it, it's up to me to find those signs and see the signals and lean into the opportunities and have the experiences and develop the connections and just asking myself the question all the time that like if my professional dreams didn't come true, what are the things I would regret not having done, not having tried? And for me, those things are things like I, I want to dive deeper into the production of the podcast to make sure that everyone who listens or watches feels like this show is um, the quality that it should be, the quality that they deserve to be watching and listening to. You know, thinking more about yeah, because my schedule's so tight at the moment, I feel like, um, you know, I'm diving into these episodes and there's very little um, pre-chat, there's very little um, interaction with a guest post-episode, you know, maybe outside of half an hour of Roof Raff. But I'm like, you know, I'd love to be catching up with the next guest and instead of just diving into the podcast, you know, going for a coffee and talking about their life and the things that we wouldn't necessarily discover on the podcast and developing the connections with them not out of any need for them to be my next best friend, but just out of a desire to deeply connect with that person and share some experiences. And maybe they love running, so we go for a run before the episode or after. Or maybe they love the gym and I'm like, all right, let's get in the gym and push each other and challenge each other. Or maybe it's, you know, hey, let's go down the beach and get in the water or like just, you know, being able to connect with these guests and enjoy the experience behind the making of the podcast I think for me is one of those other things and you know just really trying to lean into the fact that this is such a bloody privilege and you know this is what I want to be doing with my life don't take that lightly and I think certainly the last thing that I want to address before I um, sort of finish up this episode is I think in life and I know I felt this with the podcast as a sometimes when things aren't going the way that you've planned or aren't at the level you'd hope them to be, we start to feel this, um, almost this frustration with why that's the case. And then in these, especially in a pursuit like the podcast, because the podcast is so much about every one of you who listen or watch, because without you, um, the show is just me having these conversations, which is equally just important. I think you have to do things from a motivation to do them for yourself so that they're authentic and they're honest. Um, I certainly don't sit down and think, oh, what would the guests like to like me to talk about every week? Like there is certainly a personal part of the conversations as well as me recognizing that the things that likely feel I feel curious about or I feel are important that you're going to resonate with too. Not all of you, but some of you. Um, and I think that when we put too much focus on the people on the other side of our pursuits and projects, we start to then think about you know well what do they want okay well I'm going to do more of this or um, why wouldn't they be liking this already and why wouldn't this be popular already and then we start acting out of this place of like neediness and it just doesn't come across um, attractively you know and I mean that in the sense that you know why do people the re the true reason why people actually connect with these endeavors is because they see a bit of themselves or they feel a bit of themselves or they share a curiosity with the host and so I've been reminding myself lately that if my biggest efforts are to master myself, which I don't think we ever fully do, but there, if there is an effort in the pursuit of self-mastery for me to become a better version of myself, for me to be more curious, for me to ask better questions, for me to um, create a better atmosphere for the, for the guests so that we get the best out of them, then naturally all of this will just grow as a byproduct, I think. The universe rewards you when you lean into the things that feel honest. And all that to say, um, I just wanted to get here and almost vent today. Um, vent in the best way possible and just be honest and share where my head's been, where my heart is, um, what I'm excited about. Um, I guess in, I keep saying I'm about to wrap up, but you know me, I love a, love a bit of a yap, a little bit of a yarn, even if it's me staring down the barrel of the camera by myself. Um, I feel that so much good in my life at the moment. I don't want to yap on about it too much. 
and I'm almost mindful about talking about it too much, but you know, I have a fiance now, you know, my incredible partner for nearly two years, so if Sophie is God is one of the best parts of my life. She's the best part of my life. She's so incredible and I feel really privileged to have spent the last two years with her and, you know, now to be um to be engaged to her, to have had the opportunity to get down on one knee. And Sophie and I talk about this all the time because I am mindful sometimes that because I love her so much and it's such an exciting part of my life, you know, you want to share those things. We want to share the things that we're naturally excited about. I've been trying lately to refrain from, on the guest episodes, talking about her too much or our relationship, not because I don't want to, but because I don't want to bore you with that so much. And I know what I just said about being honest and leaning into those things, but you don't want to be a broken record, right? You want people to find and even for me to explore new things on the show. Um, but I, I felt like just in this solo episode to recognize how exciting that part of my life has been and how excited I am for the future to keep developing our relationship and all the exciting experiences ahead of us. And I think outside of that, like preparing for another marathon, which we, God, we feel so unprepared for at the moment, sort of five, I think about five weeks away from Run Shell Harbour, which for those of you who aren't from my local area, the Illawarra, um, it's about 30 minutes south from Wollongong and I oh, feel so unprepared. Ran 20k this morning, felt okay, but certainly didn't feel in 42k shape. And so I think, um, not to say that I, I don't believe it couldn't happen, but a fair peg away from PB times and how I felt when I've run my, my marathon PB back in 2022. But I think reminding myself that if for anything at all, uh, this is a great opportunity to step into something that is uncomfortable to step into the unknown. Well, not the unknown because I've been there before, but something that does not feel so familiar over the course of the last couple of months that there have been a lot of long runs or a lot of that marathon style training. So I'm just trying to step into it to be uncomfortable again, to learn some of the lessons that come along with that to encourage myself to you know muster that self-belief and muster a bit of that mongrel and step back into something challenging but I'm so much good happening in my life right now really excited about the next couple months supremely excited about the next couple guests for the show or the next couple months worth Um, a mix of athletes um, adventure filmmakers um, people who are in this podcast space who have incredible insights on different things, um, futurists, like really interesting conversations to come. And I'm going to absolutely bring my best to those and honor those conversations to make sure that there are super, um, super meaningful insights for everyone who tunes in. So I want to thank you for four and a half years of support on this show or for however long you've been tuning in, whether today's your first or your 244th, I think this will be episode of the show. Um, means the world to me honestly does please share this with your mates subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you choose i you know in a dream world i would do this full time not so much the solo conversations but me sitting down with the guests and we've had some fucking incredible guests the last four years especially the last 12 months we've been able to you know 12 18 months like over 2023 and 2024 so far so proud of the guests that were brought onto this show it's you know it's actually a dream of mine to speak to some of these people and i think that the next couple of years we can get some bloody stellar conversations on this podcast so you know the the more you support it the more of you who subscribe share it with your mates help new people find the show and connect the bigger this can be the more time i can spend on it um, and the more we can invest in making sure the product of the show be it the production the quality, the way that you hear it in your ears, the way that you see it through your eyes is better than ever. And to make sure that we can keep getting those great guests onto the show who naturally want to be heard and want to invest in shows, they're going to get them reach. Um, It's powered by you, um, the listeners and the viewers of the show. So thank you so much. Um, Arrivederci. And we'll see you next time. Catch you later.